And it's so much easier to have someone else like take that off your plate and help you figure it out because it's very hard to be objective. It's also hard to know. You could, you know, find all the information, but it's hard to know like, well, should I test for that? Is it worth this or what? You know, so you want somebody else to kind of hold space for you and walk you through that journey. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performance Life Podcast. Today, I am very excited to have Dr. Erin Kinney with us. She is a stress reset expert and the founder of the Stress Reset Formula. And as a naturopathic doctor and coach, she helps stressed and burnt out men and women with adrenal fatigue, improve their mood, balance their thyroid hormones or testosterone and cortisol and increase their energy. But what she's really passionate about is helping her clients reconnect with the wisdom of their bodies and reestablish harmony in their lives. So Dr. Kinney, thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. Let's jump right into it. Um, how did you... Yeah. What's a brief background and how you got interested into the work that you're doing today? Sure. Well, it's a personal story, as many people in this field um, go through to get where they are. In my early 20s, I got severely depressed. I was... Um, I was, I woke up one day, I went from running marathons to couldn't get out of bed. I had gained like 25 pounds. I'm not even five foot one. So it was a lot of weight for me. I, my joints hurt all over and I was crying all the time. I ended up going into my general practitioner's office and before I could even finish saying, I think I might be depressed. He'd written me a prescription for an antidepressant and kind of sent me on my way. And I felt, I was like, oh, it feels like it's like, okay, but it feels like there might be something else going on. I had been a vegan for a while and, you know, I had been basically running my body into the ground for four or five years running marathons. And, and I was in therapy at the time and my therapist, I was talking this through with her and she's like, you know, I just had lunch with this natural doctor of some kind. And he seems like he might be a better fit for you. So I went and saw a naturopathic doctor and he ran a whole bunch of functional tests on me and looked at my hormones, looked at my cortisol, looked at my B12 and my iron and my vitamin D and all my nutrient levels were low. And I, my adrenals were completely shot. I had super low cortisol. My hormones were in the tank and he put me on a protocol. I was in my early twenties. So I responded really well within about eight weeks. I felt almost 75% better. And I think another six weeks after that, I was back to my normal self. I'd lost the weight. I stopped crying. I was getting out of bed and feeling good. And I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. So I quit the job I was in at the time. And then I ended up, I moved to DC with a friend and I ended up getting a job in recruiting. I was a recruiter and, and I interviewed tons of people all day long and would place them into positions. And after about a year of doing that, my boss sat me down and she's like, I don't think this is the right job for you. And I said, well, I really like this job. I love talking to people. And she goes, well, you keep bringing me resumes and you tell me that, oh, they couldn't work this job because they got lupus or the mom had Lyme disease or so-and-so had cancer. And she's like, I don't really care about that. I want to know, can they do the job or not? And she's like, but I think you care. And so I kind of sat with that for a while and I ended up having lunch with a naturopathic doctor who had treated me. And, you know, I decided I wanted to go back and do this. And now I help men and women who are going through kind of what I went through. They were, they get completely burnt out. They have all these seemingly unrelated symptoms and their doctors have been like, oh, here's a prescription for so-and-so, or just lose some weight or, you know, take the birth control pill if they're female. And, you know, they feel like they've been written off, but they know something chemically is not right in their body. So, you know, I'm really passionate about it because it was the medicine that helped me. Amazing. Amazing story. Yeah. For those that aren't that familiar, what is the kind of the main difference between like a naturopathic doctor and, and like a traditional? Sure. So um, the main difference is really the way that we look at the body. And I mean that in a way like, let's say we have two patients that are presenting with diabetes uh, or any condition really. In Western medicine, if they, if the, you know, two patients with the same diagnosis are going to receive the same treatment because it's like, here's a diagnosis, here's the treatment. In naturopathic medicine, we would look at that patient and say, okay, yes, they have this diagnosis, but we would want to figure out why, like what went wrong? Like what is their lifestyle habit? What is their, you know, diet habit? What's going on with their blood sugar pathway? What's going on with their hormones? And we would help to reestablish balance in the body versus just giving a medication or a protocol to kind of help reduce the symptoms. So it's, it's kind of a philosophical difference. And there are naturopaths that use, you know, some naturopaths that use medications, but they're going to use them in a way that we're kind of trying to address the underlying cause versus, you know, bandaid on a symptom. Great. Well, tell us a little bit about what you're doing with regards to um, stress. I mean, obviously many people 
are stressed out all the time. A lot of people have lack, lack of energy, low energy. They don't know why. Um, what are some of the things that you're looking for uh, when you're kind of talking to patients? Sure. So one of the first things I like to do when I'm working with patients or when I'm teaching or speaking is, is really make sure people understand what's happening in the body when we go through a stress response. And so I like to highlight the difference between what's called the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system we think of as that it's also called the fight flight. And that's what's activated when we are stressed. And the parasympathetic nervous system is the part of our nervous system that's activated when we're relaxed. And our bodies were designed to spend about 90% of our lives in that parasympathetic or rest and digest phase and only 10% of our lives in the sympathetic fight flight phase. Unfortunately, in today's world, that's flip flop. Most of us spend about 90% of the time in that fight flight and only 10% of the time in that rest and digest. And the important thing that I like to kind of harp on here is your body can only heal from anything when it's in that parasympathetic rest and digest phase. When you're in fight flight, no healing takes place. The body is full on, I'm ready to fight or I'm ready to, you know, to run. And what happens physiologically in that state is all the blood flows in your arms and your legs, your pupils dilate, your heart rate goes up, your blood sugar goes up, your blood pressure goes up. And all of these things happen in order to get the body to run or to fight. Now, and as you think about like most of our organs are internal to the body. And, and if, if you're in fight flight, there's not a lot of blood flow in the digestive tract. There's not a lot of blood flow in the ovaries of the testicles. And so the body doesn't like to make sex hormones when we're in fight flight. It really, it's just all, all you're prepared to do in that stage is I'm going to run or I'm going to fight. Now, the unfortunate part about how our bodies were designed is that whether a lion is chasing you or you see someone wearing a mask or a child is you know yelling at you in the back of the car or you get an email or you see something on social media that you don't like the same physiologic response occurs so all of those things i mentioned the heart rate going up the blood sugar going up the blood pressure going up the blood flow going to arms and legs it's going to happen and sometimes we don't actually need that to run or to fight like if you're sitting and scrolling on social media and you see something that kind of stresses you out you don't need all your blood, you know, you don't need your blood flow to leave your digestive tract. So, and I, I like to have people kind of understand that and they're like, oh, wow, that makes sense. Like I'm spending a lot of my day in this kind of stress state, but I'm not, you know, I'm not running or fighting from anything. And so what I like to explain to people after we kind of get that concept going is, is when your stress system gets triggered, what's actually happening is your amygdala is deciding, and that's a part of your brain, I like to call it the lizard brain. It's a very black white, this is stress or this isn't. It makes the decision, is something a stressor, is it not? If it decides to stressor, it's going to send a signal to your hypothalamus, which is another part of the brain. And that part of your brain will then send a signal to your adrenals that says, hey, adrenals, I need you to pump out cortisol and adrenaline. And those two hormones are, we think of them as the stress hormones, but they're really the hormones that give you the energy to run or to fight. But so they, they help activate you and put you into fight flight. And so what's supposed to happen is let's say a lion jumps in here and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a lion. My amygdala is like stress. It's going to send a signal to the, to the adrenals. My adrenals pump out this cortisol. I'm going to have the energy I need to run or to fight. Hopefully run. I'm probably not going to fight a lion. <laughs> so I'm going to run from that lion. And once I get safe, here's the really important part. Once I'm safe, that same cortisol is supposed to go back to the hypothalamus and there's a receptor there. It's called a glucocorticoid receptor, but it's, I like to call it the off button. So it's the off button and that cortisol will bind and it will turn off further production of cortisol. So this cortisol, you know, your body has this beautiful, it turns it on and then it's going to actually come and turn it off. Now, what happens is if you are under chronic stress, right? So if Let's all, I always use the analogy of March of 2020. Everyone remembers that really fun month where every five minutes, our stress response was getting triggered. It was like, they're shutting this down. They're shutting this, this is happening. This is happening. So, and our bodies are super wise. And if you're constantly triggering that stress response to turn on, the body's like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to turn off. I'm going to stay in this heightened state because it seems like I need that right now. I need to be ready to go, ready to run or fight. So what happens is your body actually down regulates the production of that receptor. So now you literally don't have the ability to turn off. So, and, and this people are like, oh, that makes so much sense. And a lot of times what I hear when people come into my office um, or when I'm teaching workshops or seminars is they're like, I, they just, people feel like they are in this constant, like tired, but wired. They're like, I feel like I can't relax even when I try to. And oftentimes this could happen after a, like a long time of stress. So, you know, a lot of us felt this way towards the end of 2020, we've been kind of in this heightened state for a long time. And then, you know, as things started to calm down, people were like, you know, I feel like I should calm down, but I can't. And that's literally because their body wasn't making that off button. So they weren't able to turn off. And so 
what I find is really helpful is when you understand that concept, then when we start to talk about some of the things that help get your body out of fight flight or the kind of stress reducing practices that we all kind of know, like we know meditation is good for us. We know breath work is good for us. Everyone kind of knows that generally, but what's cool is there's tons of research that shows that what meditation actually does physiologically is it tells the body to upregulate the production of that off button or some of the herbal protocols that I use. That's how it actually works is it tells the body to make more of that receptor. So I know, that was a very long winded answer to, to that question, but um, that's kind of how I, I just start by teaching people. I start by having them understand and we'll, we we will talk about, hey, like, look what happened in your life. You were going through a divorce or you had a really stressful job or X, Y, Z was going on. And um, and then people start to really understand. And when I, I find when people understand the why, they're much more likely to you know make the changes that they need to in order to get their body back into that rest digest phase. Yeah, that was a great explanation. I have never heard it explained like that. And things started clicking for me as yeah. you were explaining that. Like, yes. You know, when I, in, in uh, about 10 years ago, when I had massive pain and inflammation in my fingers, hands, wrists, arms, and I was just like, first I was in fear. And then I was like, I got to get this fixed now. And there's just like this like stress of like, you know, staying up late and trying to buy every pain relief device and compression mm -hmm. sleeve and everything else yeah. I could find and all this kind of stuff. And I've seen it recently with someone else close to me as well is like they have a little issue, but then they get so much fear around the issue and they get stressed out about why am I not getting better? Why am I not getting better quicker? And then it, it kind of like from what you just explained, I'm sure that's like exacerbating the problem. Oh, totally. Worry and anxiety. And that that is also a trigger for your stress response. And so the next piece that I like to teach and I'll kind of move into this part is if you're stuck in that fight flight for a long period of time and your body stopped making the off button, now the body, the adrenals are constantly pumping out cortisol. And cortisol is what I like to call a very metabolically expensive molecule. It takes a lot of cofactors. It's a, it's a steroidal hormone. So it, it takes a lot of energy to build cortisol. And over time, if you're continually pumping out cortisol and you're not sleeping and you're you know, stuck in this fight flight, your body will eventually run out of the building blocks it needs to make more cortisol. So what we start to see is we start to see a decline in cortisol. And while we all, no, most of us think of cortisol as being like, oh, it's the bad stress hormone. It, it can be if too much of it's definitely bad, but not enough of it is arguably I find sometimes worse because it's like what I said, it is the, it is the molecule that gives you the energy to deal with stressors. It's also the molecule or the hormone that controls our circadian rhythms. It's what wakes you up in the morning. So it's what gives you energy. And the third big thing that cortisol does is it's one of our body's natural anti-inflammatory agents. It is, or prednisone is synthetic cortisol. So everyone knows, you know, you, you give it a steroid if inflammation goes crazy, like, oh, here's some prednisone. But if your body has enough cortisol, cortisol does that job. So in a lot of times, like, I don't know what you were going through, but a patient's like, oh, I've got unchecked pain all over the place, or I don't know what's causing your inflammation. Sometimes it can be, not always, but sometimes it can be from not enough cortisol. And that's sometimes people are like, wait, this is confusing. I thought my stress was high. Well, your stress was high and probably your stress still is high, but you don't have the building blocks or the, what you need to build that cortisol to give your body. And that's one of the reasons body, the body makes a lot of cortisol when there's pain or inflammation is because it's going to use that cortisol to reduce that pain and that inflammation. Now, mm. what tends to happen in that, what you, the situation that you were describing again, I don't know all the details, but um, you know, if, if you had a lot of pain, a lot of inflammation going on and you were worried about it. If the, so worry would normally trigger, you know, an increase in cortisol, but if there's not enough cortisol to make, or your body doesn't have enough, the body will overcompensate by making more adrenaline. And when you have mm. too much adrenaline and not enough cortisol, you get this really, it makes you feel anxious. It makes you feel like you've had 15 cups of coffee and no sleep and every, or not 15, several cups of coffee on a night of no mm -hmm. sleep. Everyone I'm sure can relate to how that feels. It doesn't feel very good. You've got the energy, but you're a little jittery, you're wiry, maybe, you know, it, it doesn't feel great. And so when you're kind of in that fear, anxious loop about whatever's going on in your body, that's what I tend to see. And we can test these levels. We can test, you know, the levels of adrenaline or norepinephrine and test levels of cortisol. So we can kind of see where people are. Um, but the major thing that I see when I'm checking those levels in patients is I typically see a low cortisol and a high adrenaline in a state like you were just describing. Yeah. So that's really good. And that, that explains a lot. Um, 
Yeah, that really explains a lot. This is really interesting. It's actually confirming lots of things that I thought of about the mental side of things um, and how they how they relate to the physical side. Uh, a lot of people have heard about adre- so it was what you're describing was that adrenal fatigue essentially. Yes. A lot of people yes. have heard about it, but don't really fully. They're just like, oh, I'm fatigued. Oh, sounds like I have adrenal fatigue. Is that basically what so you're describing? So adrenal fatigue would be, you know, it's funny. Some doctors are like, oh, that doesn't exist. That's not real. But our, adrenal fatigue is when your adrenals don't have the capability to make enough cortisol. So, mm-hmm. um, and that's, you know, we would test for that by testing for cortisol. And we can also look at the adrenaline or the norepinephrine. But typically in adrenal fatigue, we see low levels of cortisol. You can also see a dysregulated pattern of cortisol. So typically cortisol should be at its highest in the morning and it tends to go down throughout the evening or throughout the day. And it's at its lowest in the evening. So, and we can test, we can look at what we call a four point cortisol test where we test it in the morning. We test it, you know, mid morning, we test it mid afternoon and we test it before bed. And sometimes in the early stages of adrenal fatigue, we'll see cortisol be really high. And this is kind of when, like when someone's under that, you know, that chronic acute stress that turns into a chronic situation, they're pumping out all the cortisol. And then what tends to happen is they tend to get like a, a backwards pattern where they have low cortisol in the morning and they have high cortisol at night. So they're not sleeping well and they're tired in the morning. And, but by the end of the day, they, their cortisol up and they have a little more energy, which makes them not sleep well. And you kind of get in this weird pattern. And then after time, the cortisol patterns will just start to flatline. And then we start to, that's when people are just like really, really fatigued. So yes, adrenal fatigue would be, and typically it happens after you've been under chronic stress for a prolonged period of time. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And so you, you mentioned you were a, a vegan for a while and then you were also running marathons, which I think mm-hmm. can, you know, can be very stressful oh, on the body as well. 100%. Right? Um, and, yeah. you know, and, and looking back now, like, so now I, the other thing that I like to kind of highlight when I'm working with patients and I'm teaching is there are what I like to call external stressors. So that would be work, spouse, kids, pandemic, anything going on outside of your body. And then there's what I like to call internal stressors. And that could be nutrient deficiency, food allergies, you know, regular allergies. And it could also be an infection of some kind. So it could be like chronic Lyme disease or um, a chronic viral infection or COVID. Um, Those things, when we think about the fight flight, you know, sometimes we think about fight, like we fight an animal, but the fight part is actually mostly referring to us fighting an infection. So, and when we go into fight flight, it activates our immune system. So, um, I don't know where I was going, what your question was, but what was the question? I'm sorry, I'm rambling on about all of these things. Yeah, yeah, no, about just when you were a vegan and when you were oh, running marathons. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so, 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 and I was, and so physical exercise also running is the epitome of, of flight, right? You're in, you're in exercise yeah. is great, but if you're overdoing it and not, and I was running a lot and I was in college, I was partying, I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't, you know, I was a vegan, but I wasn't really a healthy vegan. <laughs> I yeah, just didn't yeah. eat meat. I wouldn't say that I ate a lot of vegetables. So my, like I said, my <laughs> nutrient levels were all really low, which that's super stressful to the body, right? Um, and I probably looking back, I wasn't tested for this, but I probably had some sort of underlying tick board or or viral thing at the time as well. I just wasn't tested for it, but seeing what I see now in patients, I I find that a lot. I find patients will come in with, you know, severe fatigue. They might have some hormonal disturbances and they'll say, Hey, my stress levels aren't that bad. You know, I've got a great job. I've got a great marriage. My kids are great overall. I'm not that stressed, but they're presenting to me like someone who's got extreme adrenal fatigue and they're exhausted. And usually what I'll find is in them, they have some sort of underlying chronic infection that's been stressing their system out internally, or they have, you know, a gluten allergy or they have, you know, a severe nutrient deficiency. So, you know, it's really important. I think when you're trying to assess your overall stress levels, one, we want to look at the external stressors, but you also want to make sure you're seeing a practitioner who can like check you for some of these internal things that we're talking about and making sure that there's not any major internal stress on the body. Because then yeah. on the plus side or the positive side about these, is you can do something about those. Like if you have a nutrient deficiency, we can replenish you with that nutrient. If there's an infection, we can treat the infection. Whereas sometimes if we're in a really bad work situation or like in the pandemic, we couldn't really, none of us could really do anything about what was going on you know, in the world. Like that stress wasn't one we could change, but we can change what's going on internally in our bodies. So I talk, I have a podcast as well. And I talk about how it's so important to find some sort of practitioner that you connect with that's going to like, help you figure out what's going on, get your body functioning optimally. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely want to ask, uh, in a minute about the different tests that you run, uh, on people mm-hmm. just to kind of get to the, da- get down to the bottom of what's really going on. Um, but first I'd like to ask, is there, you know, it's interesting because stress, like 
what stresses out Elon Musk might be different than what stresses out, you know, someone else, right? It's like, there's a lot of mental aspect in there. And you mentioned meditation, uh, you know, is there mm -hmm. anything else that people can do for their stress, whether it be a certain type of diet or meditation or things of that nature? So my favorite recommendation, and this is like the simplest thing ever, is to lay down for 10 minutes and, and just close your eyes. You could take a nap if you want. You could meditate if you want, but I call it getting horizontal or my late grandmother would call it taking a toes up. She would just go rest and put her toes up. And when you lie flat, your blood pressure goes down, your heart rate's gonna go down. It kind of tells the body, hey, I can chill out. And if you close your eyes, it's like removing a lot of stimuli from the system. And so it's starting to train the body that it's okay to relax. And this is ultimately what we wanna mm. start doing in order to make more mm. of that off button receptors. We wanna teach the body that it is safe to turn off. And so because the body's kind of, if the body's been stuck in fight flight, it's like, it's basically trying to protect you. It's like, hey, I'm gonna stay in fight flight. And so meditation is a, is a wonderful practice that can do that. But sometimes people that are in, have been under chronic stress, the thought of meditating or they like, try it, it's it's not comfortable. It doesn't feel good and they won't, they won't do it. But I found that like the simple practice being like, hey, just go lay down for five to 10 minutes and chill out. Mm -hmm. You could listen to music, but don't look at a phone, don't look at a screen. And that, if you start to do that every day, it starts to again, train the nervous system that it's okay to chill out. And that may lead to a meditation practice or, you know, and there's, there's tons of, there's tons of nervous system calming practices you can do. But I, what I've found is that the more complicated it is, if you're super stressed out, you might not do it. So like a really simple practice of laying down in the middle of the day is, is my, is my favorite place to start for patients. Yeah. Yeah. What about, is there any kind of specific diet that you personally like for, for yourself or for your patients? And then, and then in terms of exercise, I'm also really curious. I've actually always thought like something like people that I've heard of that ran marathons and then they had got injuries and then they like were laying in bed for two, three, like, you know, or people that run these hundred mile races and they just completely tear their bodies apart. And I'm like, I'm not sure if that's healthy. Um, obviously it's great to get cardiovascular exercise, but I'm curious, you know, what your thoughts are these days on both nutrition as well as different types of exercise and, and even extreme exercise. Yeah. So my answer to both those questions is going to be, it's going to depend on the person and the state that mm -hmm. they're in and the, the, like their hormone levels, their cortisol levels. And, but for the diet piece, the biggest component when we're looking at like a diet that helps with stress is keeping your blood sugar balanced. So mm -hmm. one, another thing that can cause stress to the system is a drop in glucose. So if your glucose levels drop, that's going to trigger the stress response to turn on. And that's because, like I said earlier, when your stress response kicks in, it, you, your blood sugar goes up. Your body is going to dump what's called glycogen out of the liver and it will get broken down into glucose. This is, you know, designed that if you haven't eaten, you can still have the energy to run or fight, right? But so if your glucose drops because you haven't eaten, say you skipped a meal or you ate something really sugary, it spiked and then it dropped. When it drops, that's going to trigger your stress response. So not eating or eating an unbalanced, you know, like he carbohydrate heavy diet or something that doesn't keep the sugar stable is going to add to the stress level. So the more balanced you can keep your blood sugar, the better off your stress system is going to be. It's not going to be responding to that change in blood sugar. So for most people, that means making sure you're getting adequate protein every three to four hours now. And that could look differently. That could be animal protein for some people that could be, you know, if you're a vegetarian. So Again, that's going to depend on the person's diet and what works for them in their body. But the, like the biggest factor I like to look at is keeping blood sugar balanced. There are so many cool tools available to see what works best for your body. Like I really like a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor that you can wear and you can see how your body responds and the best diet for you to keep that glucose balanced. So that's what I would say for diet. And again, it could look differently for different people. And for yeah, exercise- real, real, quick on, go ahead. real quick on that, just to piggyback on what you were saying, I did just wear a, a CGM. I, I'm, I'm going to put yeah. on another one again, probably tomorrow. And yeah, really, really great insights. Um, you know, for me, my hemoglobin A1C was a little higher than I would have liked to liked it to be on, on previous mm -hmm. blood tests. It's not at like pre-diabetes levels or anything, but I'm like, man, it, this seems a little higher, you know, for someone who doesn't ever eat dessert, uh, doesn't, you know, doesn't, I, I, for a long time, I was kind of keto, but over the last year I've, I've introduced, you know, some more carbs, but I'm still probably only at like a hundred grams of carbs per day, you know, if that, hmm. um, but when I was wearing the CGM, it was like any kind of carb would, would, would really, you know, spike me. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, I think, you know, eating, eating protein was fine. Eating fats was fine, but, uh, I, I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of, 
I'm kind of, I don't know if I have to come to the realization that I just like carbs are not for, for me at all, but, um, but yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, the other thing is to notice like, cause diet is obviously the major input that we're looking at when we're looking at, a, you know, how our glucose responds. But if you are stressed and sometimes, and I've seen this with people where like they're nervous about eating the carb or they're overthinking the carb and they're triggering their stress response, that could be adding to it. Cause I've, it's really interesting. I found that my patients that like they wear their CGM on vacation and they're like on vacation, I could drink alcohol and I could eat carbs and my sugars didn't spike. But when I'm in my regular life, my carbs were spiking things because it was a combination of a little bit of stress and the carbs. So there's, there's other inputs to kind of be aware of. So it's something to think about when you're using a CGM, like think about the food, but also think about the state your body was in when you consumed that food. That's fascinating. Um, yeah. yeah sometimes, so it's, because sometimes if I'm like, if I didn't eat, let's say I'm recording a, a, you know, a couple of podcasts or doing something, then it's yeah. like, I get really hungry and then maybe I'm eating a little too fast or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, also, you know, and it's funny, I, I talk about this a lot when I'm recording, you know, I know we're just sitting here having a conversation, but our nervous systems are activated right now, right? We've got our brain mm -hmm. turned on and, and for good reason, like when our, you know, I, I feel like I use you can record my best podcast when I'm a little bit in a stress state because you know I'm focused and I'm like into it but you know my my arms are sweating right now I am definitely sympathetic activated right so if you're recording all day when you do put food into your body you're already a little bit in a stress state so I find and I found this in my system personally when I'm if I'm speaking or recording or having to be in this I pretty much only eat protein um because I'm the same way. If I, if I eat car, if I already eat carb right now, my sugar would probably go through the roof. But yeah. when I'm relaxed and I'm at home and I'm in a little bit more of a parasympathetic state, my, I tolerate the carbs a lot better. And I, I find this to be a pretty common pattern that I see with my patients. So, um, so it's kind of, and the CGMs are cool because you can play around with this and you can get some data and understand like, Hey, when I'm on vacation, I'm unrelaxed. I can, you know, be a little bit more flexible with my diet. But when I'm in you know, I'm at work and I'm stressed out, I might want to be a little more rigid with, you know, the type of food that I'm putting into my system. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a great, great point there. And kind of transitioning into what the next thing you're going to talk about, like exercise. One mm -hmm. thing that was interesting that I also found too, is, is, you know, I used to like to work out a lot when I was younger. Now, I, you know, if I, if I lift weights two days in a row, I'm just forcing myself to take the next day off. And one of the reasons also was I noticed one day I had a really hard workout the day before a blood test and the, it, it really kind of messed with the results. And I just took another one a couple of months later what, with resting for two days before the blood test and the results were, were really different. So it's kind of interesting mm -hmm. because you're creating the stress response when you're, when you're, you know, doing kind of hard exercise, yep. which everyone says is beneficial, but yeah, it's talk to me a little bit about that. Well, it's beneficial if the rest of your life isn't that stressful, right? So remember how I, did, I said that we, we want to spend about, we were designed to be stressed out sometimes, right? Like in this situation, I, I you and I wouldn't want to be in a parasympathetic state right now. We'd be like, oh, and we'd be slower, talking slower, and I'd probably be forgetting things, and, you know, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be focused, right? And when, so we want some stress in our life, like some stress is good. It, it stimulates the, we want to produce a little bit of cortisol. It stimulates, um, you know, stimulate muscle growth and exercise. Like we want to break the muscles down in order so they'll rebuild. But if, so if the rest of your life is really, really stressful, you don't really want to add really stressful exercise into your routine, mm. right? You might want to, I sometimes when my patients come in and their, their stress levels through the roof and they're exhausted and they're dragging themselves to the gym, I tell them, do not work out for the next month. We're going to, we're going to rebuild your system. We can get back to that. We're going to change some lifestyle things. But right now you're actually doing more harm than good with the exercise or if, so, so it's really looking at like all of the other factors that are going on in your life to find out what the best exercise routine is for your body in this current state. And that might change, right? So like in your twenties, what, what the best exercise routine for you, you know, it might be very different from when you're in your forties. And, yeah. um, you know, particularly I, I taught, I work with a lot of women and women's hormones change multiple times throughout their life. We go through puberty, then we go through, you know, cycling years, then we go through pregnancy, if we choose to have children, and then we go through menopause and at each point of the, those changes, they're going to need a different, you know, lifestyle practices. They're going to need different diets and they're going to need different exercise practices just because of, you know, what's going on. And, and for men, like I, I find that like, you know, men's workout routines in their twenties are going to be very different from their workout routines in their forties when they maybe have kids, a family, a job, aging parents, you know, when there's all these other things going on in life, you might not want to be going and running for two hours a day or, or cycling or doing a major, you know, maybe you want to do a couple of days a week of weight training and, you know, walking or something a little bit less strenuous. But that being said, if your life is super chill, you know, if you're like, 
I don't know, a ski bum and you don't do much, like you might want to do really intense exercise because that would be similar. So it, again, it's looking at looking at where you are in your life and what your needs are. Mm, yeah, really good stuff. So what about the tests? Yeah. So uh, I assume to get down to the bottom of, of what your parent, your patient's issue is you, you must run some tests. Um, mm -hmm. What are the, the most common tests that you're, that you're running and things you're looking for? So typically when I work with anyone, I'm going to, you know, I'll do all the basic labs. I'll check their CBC and I'll look at their metabolic panel, I'll look at their cholesterol, I'll look at their glucose. We'll look at A1C. Um, but then I do a lot of nutrient testing. So I'm going to look at iron, B12, vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, copper, um, all the B vitamins, B6, B5, um, B9. So we, 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 I like to look at all the nutrient levels and then I look at hormones. So I'm going to look at, you know, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. I'm going to look at cortisol. I look at a hormone called DHEA, which is a precursor hormone to both cortisol and to testosterone. It can also be involved in energy and it's another adrenal marker that I look at. Um, and then I also, I will screen people for infections. I typically screen everyone for Lyme disease. I screen everyone for Epstein-Barr virus, which is the virus that can cause mono. 90% of adults have had it at some point, it can reactivate and cause a lot of internal stress in the body. There's a bunch of other viruses like that, but that's the most common one I see. Um, what else do we look at? Sometimes I'll look for different mold markers, depending on what their you know history is, but you know, looking at hormones, oh, and thyroid, I look at the full thyroid panel because thyroid's really important. And, um, and so yeah, hormones, nutrients, um, some infectious stuff. And those, those are kind of the big things. And I typically run that through, you know, blood work through LabCorp. Um, there are some other tests that, that I can run, you know, in certain cases, there's a test called the Dutch test, which looks very in depth at hormones. Um, it'll look at the breakdown of your hormones. You can do, like I said, a four point cortisol where we look at your cortisol levels throughout the day. So we can get a pattern. Cause when we do blood work, we're just getting a one-time snapshot which can be helpful. But if, you know, patients like, Hey, I feel great in the morning, but I'm exhausted in the afternoon, we might want to test in the afternoon or, and, and for women, the testing, it's really important when you, if they're a cycling female, it's really important to test at the point in their cycle when they're having the most symptoms. Typically I find that to be a week before their period. So for plus, you know, for menopause women, it's a different story. We can test any time, but I find this mistake, you know, what people are like, Oh, I got my labs run and my hormones look normal. But I'm like, when did you do it? And they're like, well, I don't know. And it turns out they did it on the day of their period, which all your hormones are normal on that part of your cycle. So, so it's really important to know when to have the testing done as well yeah. as what to test for. Really interesting that you mentioned that because I had not heard of that until just recently, my wife did a full on, um, you know, uh, panel with hormones and everything else. And it said specifically like to do it, like, uh, you know, this many days after or something like that. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. I've never, I never heard of that before. Um, but now, and now I'm hearing you mention it. Um, I wonder how many thousands of, of women, uh, you know, are thinking, you know, getting completely wrong results because they're not even paying attention to that. A lot. I, I see a lot of women coming and they're like, oh, I did all my hormones and here they are. And, and sometimes all my hormones means they have one or two tested. So they didn't get enough tested and it was tested at the wrong time. Or they're like, I don't know. I wasn't tracking my cycle, which is another thing that's really important. I find a lot of women don't track their menstrual cycle. And they're like, I don't know. I think I got a period last month or come to the end of the month. It's really important. It's a really important biomarker to see like how your health is. Um, so yeah, so test and for men, you know, that's not going to make as much of a difference when they test, but, but if we're looking at cortisol or, you know, want to check those levels, you know, when we test during the day and you can do blood work in the afternoon to look at afternoon cortisol, but sometimes that four point cortisol testing can be more helpful to give you a graph of what your cortisol looks like. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, so you talk a lot about restoring balance back in people's lives. Uh, um, so you're, what are, well, I guess, what are some of the most common issues that you're seeing and what are some of the things that you are, um, you know, kind of advising your patients to do? And you mean that in like symptoms that you see, common symptoms I see or? Um, yeah, I guess, or, or I guess most common like issues that, you, that you're seeing, like, I mean, Lyme disease sounds, you know, can be really intense, but seems kind of like it's kind of rare, right? It It's actually not rare. I diagnose it more times than I would care to. Like, wow. I think I've diagnosed it seven times this week. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. yeah it's, it's really, like on, so it, it's, like it's why I check, I check coast. everyone for it. Go ahead. Like on the West Coast, um, there's is there less Lyme? Is that like a rumor? Is it like mo I, I thought like it was mostly on the East Coast, Connecticut, or Honestly, something. Honestly, it used to be, but at this point, it's it's like it it's spread. I mean, I and it depends on where you know people might have traveled somewhere. They might have gone hiking and gotten bit by a tick. But it's it's quite shocking to me how often someone comes back with a positive Lyme panel, um, and. Yeah, that's why I screen everyone for it because sometimes it's someone that I wouldn't expect. Like sometimes people just have 
menstrual irregularities, no other symptoms, and we determine, or they have weight gain that nothing has worked for, we under, uh, uncover that they have Lyme, we treat the Lyme, they lose weight, or we treat the Lyme and their menstrual periods, you know, get back to, into regular balance. So, um, but common symptoms I see, I see fatigue, I see insomnia, I see headaches, I see mm -hmm. constipation or diarrhea, some sort of GI upset. Um, and then on the, kind of in the Melta realm, I'll see, you know, depression, anxiety, or just feeling overwhelmed, like so overwhelmed. And that's a really common one, I think, in today's world, especially if you've got health issues. There's so much information out there, right? You can listen to podcasts and you can, like we're talking today, you can go on social media and follow these health influencers. You can read Google and there's, there's so much information out there. So you could Google your symptom and then be like, oh my God, I don't know what to do with this. But again, this is why I stress if you're feeling overwhelmed about what's going on in your body, work with a practitioner, have somebody, even like, you know, sometimes my patients are like, well, you probably don't need a doctor. I'm like, oh no, I have four. I, <laughs> I have plenty because I'm a huge hypochondriac, even though I know all that I know. And it's so much easier to have someone else like take that off your plate and help you figure it out because it's very hard to be objective. It's also hard to know. You could, you know, find all the information, but it's hard to know like, well, should I test for that? Is it worth this or what? You know, so you want somebody else to kind of hold space for you and walk you through that journey. So again, it's one of the biggest things I stress on my show, no matter what you're dealing with, find some person who is an expert at that and help, you know, have them help you walk through it. Um, yeah, because I guess, yeah. like I said, overwhelm is probably the number one. I, I don't think I've had a patient in the last six months who didn't list overwhelm as one of their chief complaints. They're just like, I just feel so overwhelmed, whether it's life or, you know, whatever's going on. And that's usually a symptom when you feel so overwhelmed, that's usually a symptom of adrenal fatigue. It's like your system just can't even handle anything. I can't, I can't manage to get these daily tasks done. I feel overwhelmed all the time. And so that's one of the biggest things that I hear from my patients. Yeah. I mean, it's so easy to get overwhelmed when you're reading, you know, you, you pull up Google and then, and you hear about all these crazy, you know, things. And it's, it's crazy. I had someone pretty close to me recently who, you know, again, they've been feeling a lot of the symptoms you've been talking about, you know, fatigue, insomnia, all this kind of stuff. And every day they were like, you know, every day, every time I would talk to them, it's like, I think I got this. And then it was like, I think I got this. And then it was like, what do you think about that? You think I got this? And it, it was like, mm. they just kept reading and yeah. I really think it can, it can, it can drive you nuts and just make the situation well, worse. And you'll read about it and you'll get stressed about it. Right. Like, and it right. makes you nervous and it makes you anxious and that is perpetuating the stress response. So it kind of keeps you, it's keeping you in that stress state. Um, like I said, I'm a huge hypochondriac. And even mm -hmm. though I have all the knowledge, I'll still, if I get a random symptom, I, I I'm not allowed to Google stuff about myself because <laughs> I'll get into this crazy cycle. And then sometimes Sometimes you'll start worrying about a symptom and you'll actually make the symptom worse. I'm sure people yeah. listening have experienced that where you're like, I've got a headache and then I'm Googling the headache and Google says I've had cancer and then the headache gets worse and you're like, oh, maybe I have a brain tumor. And, you know, everyone's, I'm sure, been down that path before. So, again, and this is where it's nice to have a provider where you can be like, hey, this symptom is happening. Can you please run a test or figure out what this is? And then you just like turn off the computer and <laughs> go back your day and stop Googling because yeah. It, yeah. it can make yeah, things that's worse. crazy. Yeah. Um, so I assume like with Lyme, that's like a pretty specific protocol to, to help someone recover from, from that. Right. Yes. 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 I'll say that. With, yes. With a caveat. Um, there are lots of different ways you can treat Lyme and oftentimes Lyme, it, it's a complicated thing to treat. Sometimes when you, when you catch it and it's acute and you know, you had a tick bite and you take antibiotics right away, that can clear it out. But if it's, if it's chronic Lyme, it, it can be a little bit harder. Um, Lyme is a, it's an interesting bacteria. It's called a spirochete. So it's similar to syphilis. If anyone listening has studied syphilis, it's got three stages. It has the primary stage where it kind of affects the joints and, you know, um, can give you headaches and make you fatigued. And then it has a secondary stage where it kind of goes a little bit deeper. And then when it goes into the tertiary stage, that's when it gets into the central nervous system. So it can affect the brain. It can affect mood. It can affect, it gets into the spinal fluid and it's really hard to kill it when it's there. Mm -hmm. It also, it acts a little bit like a virus. It likes to hide. So um, it, it can be tricky and, you know, everyone, most people know someone who struggled with Lyme disease. Um, you know, you can't treat it, you get better for a bit. And then sometimes it can come back if you haven't fully treated it. So it can be a little bit complicated. So if, if you're concerned, you might have Lyme, you want to make sure you're working with a provider that is Lyme literate, that knows what they're talking about, that knows what they're doing. Um, yeah. and I, in some cases I, I treat it, but I oftentimes will, you know, I diagnose it and I sometimes will refer them out to someone who specializes in treat. That's all they do is treat Lyme. Um, cause there can be a lot of nuances, you know, in treating that. 
Yeah, yeah. And then with hormones, I think, especially, right, for many people in their 40s and 50s, uh, a lot of different hormonal um, kind of maybe imbalances or things going on. So with those, are you kind of using bioidentical, you know, hormones, hormone replacement therapy, things of that nature? In some cases. So, and I guess we're kind of going back on the, like, how do we balance things? Really, the first step with any of these things we're talking about with my patients is, so let's say they have a hormonal imbalance. My first item on my agenda is to figure out why their hormones are imbalanced. Right. Oh, so, and maybe that is they have Lyme disease. And I don't think I said this yet on the show, but I say this a lot, your body, it either is making sex hormones or it's making stress hormones, typically not both. So if the body's in a stress state, it downregulates the production of testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. Think about it biologically. If, if you're under a lot of stress, you don't really want to make a baby. So the body's like, I'm not going to make sex hormones because those are baby making hormones. So typically, um, you know, if the system's super stressed, we see a decline in hormones or an imbalance in hormones. So we want to address that piece first, if we can. And I, I do use bioidentical hormones. I think they could be wonderful, especially for postmenopausal women. And sometimes, you know, andropause, which is, you know, as men age, we I do a lot of testosterone replacement, but that's usually after we've addressed some other things. Like I usually will treat someone's adrenals. If there's an infection thing, we want to clear that out first. I find bioidentical hormones don't work unless we've started to work on some of the other things first. Um, so it's really, you know, the, the, that balance question, it's, we're figuring out what caused the system to be out of balance. And then we're working on whatever that piece is. Right. So, and that could look different for many different, different people. Amazing. Amazing. Really good stuff. Um, shout out your podcast and, and how else, where else can people follow you, sure. find you, learn more? Sure. So I hang out on Instagram a lot. I'm at Dr. Kinney. Um, I post stuff, I do reels and, you know, stories and whatnot. And, um, and then I have a podcast called the Dr. Kinney show and we get, I get guests that come on, talk about everything from, you know, an expert in Lyme or autoimmune disease, or sometimes I'll get people to talk about like frequency healing or sound healing. I kind of, I kind of, it, it spans a lot of different, you know, um, things in the alternative health world. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's pretty fun. So you can check that out. It's on all the major podcast platforms. And if you go to my website, we have a couple free downloads. We've got an adrenal fatigue download, and I think we have a bloating download going on right now too. So you can go grab those and get on our mailing list. And we, we send out emails, you know, with different topics about different stuff going on as well. Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time here today. You, you really did some great explanations and um, some things were clicking for me. Uh, and and I've, uh, I've done a lot of podcasts with a lot of people and uh, I've learned a lot here myself and, and really great. appreciate your time and highly recommend people go check out your show and, and all your other resources as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was a great chat. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, can you please leave us a rating or review and subscribe? I've realized that while we have actually increased our downloads a lot, we're actually getting a lot of downloads, which I'm really happy about. We actually have very few ratings. So, and I realized that I've never asked people really to rate much. So I'm asking you now, if you could please rate and review and subscribe. And if you enjoyed the episode, please forward it along to anyone that you think will get value out of this. Also, if you haven't checked out our line of products at buypeakperformance.com, you get 20% off your first order. That's www.buybuypeakperformance.com. Dot com. We have some incredible products, including our organic high altitude coffee. If you don't know this, coffee is one of the most heavily sprayed with pesticides out of any crop. So it's really important that you drink organic coffee. We've gone above and beyond to source what we believe is the highest quality and healthiest organic coffee in the world. We're also famous for our organic green superfood powder. You can get 20% off of that as well at buypeakperformance.com. We also have an organic vegan and paleo plant protein. See, most of the vegan proteins out there are using brown rice protein, which is really not a good source of protein, and it's also a grain. And if you're paleo, you know that grains tend to cause inflammation in some cases for some people. And so we wanted to make one that was paleo-friendly and vegan and organic. We made an amazing amino acid profile, so it's really one of the best plant proteins for muscle building. So you can check out Peak Performance Organic Plant Protein. You can find that on our website. Of course, all our products are on Amazon as well. So thanks again. And again, please, if you enjoyed the episode, please forward it along to someone who you feel can get value out of it. And please leave us a rating, review, and subscribe. Thank you.